Um, if those of you, I think many of you know me already, and many of you are probably familiar with Penelope's work too. So I'm Ryan Morrison, and I'm the publisher at Informants. And I'm really delighted to have Penelope Roscoe with me today um, to discuss a project that we've been working on together. So Penelope is a pianist and professor of piano pedagogy at Trinity Laban in London. I find pedagogy such a difficult word to say, <laughs> but I better get used to it given what we're doing. Um, and she's also uh, the UK's foremost specialist in working with pianists with injuries. And I think, as I say, she probably doesn't need much of an introduction because many of you are probably very familiar with her work. And um, you'll see on her piano, there is her weighty tome, uh, which I think is pretty much uh, for many people has become their, their Bible of piano technique, which is her book, The Complete Pianist. And so what we're going to be talking about today is that following on from her book, uh, we've been creating an online course um, for teachers called Teaching Healthy Expressive Piano Technique. And um, although it's aimed primarily at teachers, there's quite a lot in, in the uh, course that is directly relevant to pianists as well. Um, so um, there should be something in, in this for, for pretty much for everyone. Um, but the main idea behind the course is to give conservatoire students and piano teachers both new and experienced an in-depth understanding of how to teach all aspects of piano technique to students of any level. So it goes all the way through from uh, beginner through advanced, through to the advanced level. Um, and there's a fabulous uh, selection of repertoire once again from elementary pieces up th through to, you know, your Rachmaninovs and Beethoven sonatas and lists and things like that. Um, so we'll be launching in the fall and the idea behind the session is just to give kind of, I guess it was like a sneak preview, an overview um, of, of, of what we're doing. And also uh, Penelope is gonna show some examples as well of some of the material covered. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kick off uh, by, just so you actually know what we're talking about. I'm gonna kick off by giving just a, uh, basically a, a little demo of it. Um, yeah, just like a, a very brief tour. Um, but before I do that, I think I'd just like to share some, uh, so my personal background in terms of working with Penelope and why uh, this for me is something more than just a, uh, <laughs> a commercial project. Um, so I uh, studied music at university and then I gave up shortly after. In fact, I actually dropped out um, due to injury. And um, I, you know, while my teachers at the time, I think had the best of intentions, none of them had been taught how to teach a healthy technique and how to deal with injuries. And um, I was one of many people who I encountered who had problems with injury. And I think I developed so many bad habits. I actually got to the point where as an adult, where um, I wanted to start playing again, um, I was told I wouldn't be able to play um, because I just made such a mess of my, <laughs> my forearms and wrists and all sorts of things. Um, but I came across Penelope's work a few years back and um, I, I was in, uh, working in the publishing industry and started publishing resources for musicians. And um, I was very interested in Penelope's work because basically my approach to publishing something is uh, one of the ways in which I, I decide whether I want to pursue something is, uh, is it something or is it information that I wish I'd had however many years ago when I was studying music? And uh, Penelope's work certainly ticked the boxes. Um, and so we collaborated on various projects. I think we, we put a yoga for musicians uh, DVD online. We worked on a series on ergonomic piano fingering, um, uh, some videos, and then a catalog of uh, pianist injuries and um, dealing with, uh, I guess, dealing with, it, with injury. Um, and uh, in this process, I applied a lot of what I learned from Penelope's um, materials and teaching and had a few uh, lessons uh, with her myself. And I'm pleased to say that I'm actually back playing again, uh, not uh, without any issues, but uh, certainly at a level I never thought really would have been possible. And there were several things from Penelope's work that I think were really important for me in terms of being able to just get back to yeah, to get back to playing with arts, excruciating pain and frustration. And so um, I, I really believe that what this, what this course is doing is so important in that had I been taught this way, um, or even just, just as a small part of, of, of what we cover in the course, I don't think I would have had the same issues now. And I probably would have been able to have a much more enjoyable time playing the piano and certainly less frustration. So it's, it's very much um, a personal mission as well that I, I'm really um, uh, privileged to be, be involved in this. So just a very quick overview of, of the course. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen um, and I'm gonna sort of like a, 
I've done this for, for ages now, but it's just, there's always a bit of a, a, a hold one's breath. There we go. Okay, share. Okay, so this is just a, a brief overview of what's in the um, in the course. So it's divided into six sections. The first section, a whole body approach, covers um, its basic fundamentals uh, and principles around uh, healthy playing, uh, position at the keyboard, and also includes Penelope's warm up sequence, which is um, uh, really really important, really useful. Um, then the, the next section, uh, sorry, the next part uh, looks at finger tone, finger touch and tone production. And now I think one of the things about this that's really, really interesting to me is, uh, and I think what differentiates Penelope's approach and this course from so many of the really dry technical manuals and studies and things we see is that it's very much written from the point of view of what is your objective, what, what sound you want to create and what is the music image that you want to project. And technique is a means to that end rather than just you know, something you mindlessly do or work on um, for the sake of it. And so this looks at different types of finger touches and um, very much, I suppose, how the fingers work and how the hand works um, to, to make sound. Then we get on to scales and arpeggios, which I'm sure all of us are familiar with, um, and uh, quite a lot of information they're dealing on some of the ch technical challenges um, associated with them. And then a whole part on chord playing and um, the movements associated with chord playing or different types of movements and different types of chords. Then a section on uh, teaching well-rounded musicians. Um, but really what this covers is um, it's other movements and aspects of playing that um, are not dealt with under, um, uh, for example, the part two. Um, and so it'll be things like leaps and using rotation and so on. So it's all the other, so it's a whole lot of, uh, I guess, all of the different movements you would encounter as a pianist. And then the last section looks at different aspects of music and how technique relates to them. The, the things like uh, voicing um, and exercises and things for developing voicing or the ability to voice, articulation, dynamics, um, ornaments, and the last section of all is a really fantastic one on pedaling, which we had a lot of fun doing with all sorts of different camera angles on feet and dampeners and things like that. Um, so it's divided into six parts. There's 31 sections in total. Each section is a video of sort of 10 to 30 minutes. And I'm just going to jump to um, an example here. Oh, sorry, I should have reset that. Uh, I'm watching it. Um, so let me just let me just refresh that page. So this one is an example from the scales. Uh, this one is a bit longer, it's about half an hour long, but they're also broken up into chapters. So um, you, you get the sort of yeah, bite-sized chunks. Um, then when we, when we actually, uh, I'm just going to mute this a little bit because I know somebody said it was very loud when I was playing. So um, we can jump to different chapters. So it's always For each of the videos, um, we have video notes. Um, uh, Sorry, for, for different chapters, we have video notes. Um, there are things like, uh, let me just jump to this. Um, musical examples and excerpts, There's there are loads of them <laughs> through, throughout. Um, and uh, uh, let me give another example here. Um, so here's, uh, here's some of the exercises that are illustrated no, in this video. The first thing. Actually, let me just mute that. It's probably a bit better. I realized that I wanted to have the sound, but I realized that sort of we're both been talking at the same time. So the video would demonstrate something, and then there will be all this reference material. And then this also has a downloadable version of the exercises here as well. Um, so it's quite a lot of uh, detail and information and functionality there. We also use um, we also use quite a few uh, uh, different camera angles and things to get um, I guess to give an idea of how uh, what different ang uh, sorry different movements look because obviously sometimes this is an example of the overhead sometimes the overhead is really important sometimes we want to close up uh, to to view an up down movement rather than a lateral movement so um, yeah it was quite a, a we had quite a lot of fun shooting all of that. Um, so basically, this just gives you an idea of some of the um, uh, content that we have. Um, I'm just going to stop that now for a second. Um, and um, uh, Penelope is actually going to demonstrate some of the materials, or, or like a few examples, extracts live. So rather than making you watch that video, because I know it doesn't always come out that well over um, Zoom when you replay a video that's then recorded by Zoom. Um, so um, we're rather going to um, 
uh, she'll uh, just illustrate a few examples from it. So basically, uh, what I'd like to do now is um, I'm just going to have a chat with Penelope and we, we're going to discuss a few aspects of the course and hopefully give you some more ideas and insights as to um, what, uh, what is coming. So I think I mentioned why uh, this is really important to me um, as a project, um, uh, but Penelope, uh, it would be really nice if you could just share for us what your mission with this is and, and what do you hope to achieve with the course? I work a lot with uh, teachers, both students who are aspiring to be teachers and, and uh, it, teachers who are working in the field. Um, some are very experienced and some are, some are just starting up. And I find that, um, there's a common concern that they feel they don't know quite well enough how to teach the technique. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is to give teachers better understanding of the principles of technique, um, principles of healthy techniques, so they can give their students a, a technique that will sustain them throughout their career. Um, and also to give some very practical suggestions of, of ways that they can solve any, any technical problems as they come up in, in the lesson time. Um, so each of the exercises I've given um, is, is aimed to be a very quick exercise, which will, you can use absolutely in, in every time you come across a problem in the lesson. And I also wanted to show how all the techniques that we see in very advanced players all stem and they all have their, their beginnings in those first few years of training. And I wanted to show teachers ways in which they could teach uh, these very important aspects of technique and all the principles of technique right from the beginning stages. And I think this is one thing that um, teachers often find difficult. Certainly my students who are, who are teachers are often asking me questions about, well, how can I relate that to a beginner? So this is what I've done here. And so I've tried to give examples of exercises and pieces um, that relate to all different levels. So I take a topic, and then discuss it and how to teach it um, at all different levels to a wide variety of different sorts of students too. So I might be talking about a, a young child or, or a very stiff adult. Okay, and I think, um, you know, let's going back um, a little bit uh, further, um, it'll be really interesting, I think for, for a minute, I mean, obviously I know your story, but um, for, for, I think so um, uh, people would really like to know what led you to be interested in specializing in healthy piano playing and teaching, or, and, you know, I guess um, before this course, what, what, yeah, what, what sort of inspired that? Well, I, like you, Ryan, had an injury when I was a student. Um, I was practicing Liszt, the Liszt Second Piano Concerto and I was practicing octaves for hours on end and nobody had advised me that wasn't an, a, a wise thing to do. And uh, so I, I got a thumb, I developed a thumb problem that was particularly bad when I played octaves. And in those days, there was very little knowledge, um, certainly in England at that stage. And so I had nobody to help me. So I just had to start to work it out for myself. And I experimented with everything. Um, I looked into other techniques such as yoga and Tai Chi and Alexander um, and I used a lot of those principles to to help myself. Um, but then as I became more and more involved in teaching I found that my students were coming to me with a, a wide range of, of different sorts of problems and now I'm, almost every day um, somebody is contacting me and saying I've got a, I've got a hand problem can you help me. And that really concerns me because I think we've got to um, address these issues before they arise. Um, so we've all as teachers, we've got to be very much aware of prevention. Um, so about 20 years ago, I produced a, a DVD called Yoga for Musicians, which was about how we can uh, apply yoga principles to, to instrumental playing. It was generally to all instrumentalists in general. But I always knew that I was going to follow that up with a with a something very specifically piano related. Um, so, fifteen years it took me to write the complete pianist, um, <laughs> and it finally came out in, last year. Um, and um, so, that was a, a major. It, that was bringing together all the experience I'd developed over forty years. Um, sharing it with with pianists in general um, but now of course I um, feel I want to not only share it with the pianists but to share it with the teachers 
Um, so you might be wondering, well, you know, how does this, the course that we're doing here, how does it differ from The Complete Pianist? And whereas The Complete Pianist covers almost every aspect of playing, it's huge, um, it is from a playing point of view. And so what I've done in these, it's a nine hour series of videos. It's very, very in-depth and, and um, very meaty substance to it. Um, uh, I've picked out, the, I've really focused on the aspects of piano teaching. So how we teach the technique. Um, so although every aspect of technique, as far as I'm concerned, has a musical purpose. So it's technique, as far as I'm concerned, is about movement and it's about sound. Um, so it's not the traditional idea of technique as, as boring old finger exercises. It's something much more interesting than that. Um, uh, so what I've um, tried to do here is give something very, very practical for teachers to use in their in their teaching practice. Yeah, it's also, um, it's a, uh, I suppose a coincidence, but uh, sort of amuses me immensely that, um, and I know you know this Penelope, just for the, the amusement of everyone else, uh, the, uh, I think the, the pieces that we both, the piece that we both struggled with and we have in common because the end of my uh, <laughs> pianistic career was Liszt's second piano concerto too. <laughs> I think it may have something to do with octaves and uh, yeah, a bit too much like, I don't know, it's a teenage aggression or something like that. But yeah, and um, but it, it is, um, I think that uh, the, uh, in terms of the, the, the difference as well, because I think a lot of people here actually, you know, would have, I think actually I know a few people here have, um, definitely have, have read your book. Um, and I think that, um, although yes, we've said that this is aimed very much at um, teachers, um, there are quite a few of the, I suppose all of the exercises and many of the principles discussed, one would be able to watch the videos and, and apply oneself. I guess the other difference is, um, if, from my perspective, is, is that the, the book is a text-based uh, uh, resource primarily with some supplementary videos, whereas this is a bit different in that it's, it's actually the other way around, in that it's nine hours of video footage. So it's more of a set of lectures and demonstrations. It's much heavier in terms of demonstrations, perhaps a bit lighter in terms of uh, text and, exam and examples and things, because those are sort of added in around the videos as and when they, they are um, uh, relevant. Um, well, some people sorry. respond better to video and some prefer to read. So I think, uh, you know, the, it, it's, offers something for everybody in, in, in these two versions, really. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, from, from a publishing perspective, I think at the end of the day, there's an underlying message that one wants to convey. And there's different formats and ways of packaging that. And I, I don't I don't really think one is better than the other. I think many people pr will prefer a print book or to read, and many people want to watch something as a lecture series. Um, I think what's really been quite fun with this, though, is, is that because it's a primarily video-based medium, we could get into a lot of detail. I know we spent uh, many, many hours working out the right camera angles and things to be able to show, because I think sometimes a picture or not even pictures, just a little animated video clip uh, speaks many thousand words, um, particularly when it comes to uh, yeah, movement and things like that. Um, so um, I think I mentioned briefly how I see it as being a bit different, but it'd be really nice to hear in your own words, Penelope, in terms of how you would see your approach to technique. I know you've touched on a few points of this, but how, how your approach to technique and teaching technique differs from what many of us probably have um, had some experience of. Well, obviously, um, I'm working very much in the sort of wellness field, so that is underlies um, a lot of what I'm working on. Um, but what I've discovered over and over again over the years is that healthy technique is also good technique. You know, if you're feeling free, if you've got good movements, if you're feeling comfortable, you move freely around the keyboard. You can play with power because you know how to coordinate the muscles and use the power from, from the upper arm and the back, for instance. Um, you can play with delicacy. Um, so a good technique is, is good piano playing and it all is dependent on using the body in relation to the keyboard 
in its most natural way. If we're very tense, if we're, we're rigid, if we're struggling, it will come out in the sound. Um, so that's so the first thing is, is really the ergonomic, um, healthy approach, which then spills over into every aspect of piano playing. Um, another thing which is very fundamental to my teaching is that I don't start with tiny movements because I find students find that very, very difficult. So I, like probably most of you, started playing the piano with just five finger exercises around middle C. And you see, even then, you see what an uncomfortable position that is. My shoulders are pulled in, my elbows are pulled in, my hand is actually twisted in this way. Um, that's exactly the sort of position that actually can lead to the thumb, thumb problem that I had later on. Um, so, um, so I find if I start by teaching very small movements, students find that very difficult. So what I do with every exercise is I start from a warm up, which is using a very broad movement. Um, and then I minimize that. I start to, um, to turn it into a much smaller movement, a much more, more refined movement so that we can use it at more and more advanced level. Um, and I'll, I'll give some examples of that if you like uh, later on. Um, what I've also tried to do is to find very quick solutions that work step by step. So you can use them very easily with students at all levels. Um, I don't know about you, but it. <laughs> I have an exercise that I call the parachute touch, which those of you who have read the book or seen other things that I've done will know about. Now, it seems like the simplest exercise. You can teach it to a lot of students in 10 minutes, but it took me 40 years to develop that exercise. Um, even two years ago it was called the fundamental arm hand cantabile touch or something. I, it, I was still developing it, developing it even at that stage. Um, and so what I'm trying to do here is to find very quick answers. So to distill the problem to its, its simple, simplest most natural movement and then to express that in the most approachable way. So what I'm trying to do is also give them fun. So I use a lot of imagery. I never say, oh, do this with your elbow or do this with your wrist or, um, uh, well, I do to teachers because you need to ex understand what's, what's happening. So I give a lot of anatomical background for the teachers so you've got the understanding. But when we're working with, especially with children, we want things that have got fun names that are fun to do. Um, so that's, that's my aim, to create something which is very sound ergonomically, which has a very deep significance in terms of technical development, uh, but is also fun. Yeah, I, I think um, I could certainly second that. I mean, how I would describe some of the things that um, I've used um, fr from, from this is that um, when you talk about simple solutions, um, a lot of that seems to be coming from like a felt sense that is to that an awareness and so much of it actually. I mean, I, that was the sort of the big eye opener for me in using a lot of these things that I just became aware very quickly uh, through some of these exercises of a lot of unwanted tension and a way of moving that was very, very constrained and, and not free. And I think, um, so even though I suppose for myself personally, many of my habits, bad habits were uh, if you're know, created over a long period of time. So they don't necessarily fall away immediately. But I did find that just by doing a few things, um, e even just after a few minutes, there would be some kind of a light bulb um, and uh, something so clicks into place and an immediate um, improvement, um, which I think is very encouraging as well. And um, I, I, I like what you're saying there, Penelope, about, because um, this definitely came, came across to me uh, in the material about um, making things fun for beginners. Um, but I think that's the other way that I would describe a lot of the material that I've seen is, it, is there's a freedom to it. You're not constrained around middle C. There's imagery from the start and it, it, it's all about music making and how you use the body to make music as opposed to you know now you've got to play your middle c scales and these are the exercises you're going to do and if you can't do those exercises then you know i'm going to tell your parents why you know i don't know <laughs> it's just the, the opposite of the approach that uh, probably uh, one one should have i suppose if you want to inspire people to carry on playing 
Um, so if you were speaking to me as a piano teacher, um, or I suppose as a pianist, um, what would you um, what would you say that you would expect that I would get out of the course? I would hope that anybody watching this course would um, gain a very thorough grounding in how to teach all aspects of, of piano technique um, to all levels. That was my aim. Um, and, I, and I hope that's what you'd achieve out of it. And I think that what we've tried to do in the course is um, to um, give it a really clear structure. So if you want, you can start at the beginning on day one and, and watch all the, the, the videos in order because there is a natural progression between them. Um, but because of the way Ryan has set it all up, it's very easy to navigate around it. So as he showed you, you can go onto the scales and, and an arpeggio section um, and you can think, right, I need that, or I need to look at fingering, or I need to look at that. And so if you've got a question that's come up in a lesson, you can always say, oh, well, let's, let's look at that next week. And you can always use this, use this as, a, as a, a, a reference resource um, whenever a, a problem comes up in a lesson. So you can dip in and out if you want, or you can watch it all um, as a sequence. What I wouldn't do is just sort of binge watch it and, you know, as some people do with Netflix and just sort of watch it for nine hours in one day. Um, I would strongly recommend that you stop with each section and try out the exercises because until you've absorbed it yourself and understand how it works for you, um, you really won't be able to uh, teach it very effectively. Um, so don't rush through it. Um, try it out yourself first you know, and take a week over that if you need to, to really absorb it and understand it. Um, and then maybe try it with one student. And then if, if you see their face light up, uh, you'll find that you're wanting to use it for other students as well. Yeah, I think um, in sort of uh, um, what you're referring to there is very much how yeah how we've tried to design this in that um, in in sort of online learning parlance uh, that dipping in and out is just in time, so it's more of a reference type of thing. So it's designed to make it really easy to do that uh, without having to sort of remember page numbers and things. But at the same time, yes, you could do it sequentially. Although yes, uh, although I, I'm sure many people would be tempted to binge watch it, um, I think yeah, it definitely makes sense at the various stages to stop and and try things out. Um, you've actually answered one of my other questions there, but I think we've talked a lot about this course and I've showed a very, very brief sort of few screenshots uh, of it. It would be quite nice. And um, if you could maybe uh, demonstrate some of the concepts that you um, uh, touch on in the course. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, forgive me, those of you who've actually seen me talk about these things before. Um, uh, but obviously those of you who are new, new to my work will be interested in these. Um, Ryan, you didn't show the scale um, section, so I might also show that as well. Yeah, I was yeah, yeah, that's fine, yeah. yeah. It's probably better live than over recorded video. <laughs> yeah, so I thought I'd start with the parachute touch because I think it's so fundamental. What it does is it teaches a student to produce a beautiful sound. And the reason for that is because they learn to coordinate the whole arm. And when you're coordinating your whole arm, you minimize any tension in the elbow and in the wrist and the shoulder. So it becomes a very free movement. So instead of coming down and everything's very rigid, which causes a, a sharp edge to the sound, everything comes down, the wrist automatically relaxes as does the elbow. Um, and it can be used in examples from, from beginners right the way through to, I, I teach it to professional musicians Who've, who've got a problem, whose sound isn't how they want it to be. Um, and I teach very similar exercises to both. And this is what I find fascinating because we use the same movements with the same human being, whether we're just starting to learn or whether we've been learning for 20 years. Um, so for instance, how I would teach it to a beginner, I would say, for instance, I start with a very bored movement and we might even start with just doing some real swinging action. So what we're doing is getting the whole arm moving in one piece, very loosely. And then we might start to think, well, yes, we can swing it up and then we can let it come down. We might land on our knee or we might land on the closed keyboard. Um, so that then they're feeling that they're just 
experiencing the movement without worrying about, am I playing the right notes? Because as soon as they start to think about right notes, somehow an element of, of uh, tension often comes in. So we often start with movements, which are warm-ups I call them, which are just getting the very broad movement, freeing up the movement. Um, so um, with, with the children at the very beginning, I just talk about balloons and about a balloon bobbing up and down. And I'm using this movement and I'm just doing it with one finger, the third finger, and we can already start to do it in a piece. So we're just doing. So even in, you know, the first few lessons, we can be doing a piece with absolutely beautiful, well-coordinated well technique. Um, now, when after that, I, rather than just talking about the bobbing balloon, I start to talk about the concept of a, of a, uh, of a parachute. And I talk about actually a cat hanging from a parachute. It's called parachuting puss. Um, because the idea is that when you come down hanging from a parachute, you're using, you're just dropping with gravity. So there's absolutely no pressure onto the ground. You just sink in to your knee or onto the wood or onto the keyboard. Um, and so this is a very simple way to teach how to use arm weight, how to drop into the keys with arm weight, not using any pressure whatsoever. So we actually start, even, even with more advanced students, just uh, dropping onto one finger usually. So we just maybe start. So you can see there I'm doing quite a big movement and it's come from the big movement where I'm just parachuting down very slowly or a little bit faster. It's actually the same movement, but it's been minimized. So at first we do quite a big movement, um, and then we don't, um, we don't worry about whether you play wrong notes, because that's not the aim. The aim is to get a beautiful sound for it to feel really comfortable and easy. Um, and then um, we'll start to put that into practice in two notes, three notes. So we put into practice with two notes, and then with three notes. to realize obviously you're not going to do that for the beginner um but you start to realize how every phrase every scale can start with this beautifully coordinated movement so the scale starts with a soft wrist with a comfortable arm so it's much easier to play a scale or or a melody so i then introduce that technique into playing melodies uh simple melodies um so we might have a phrase which just goes So it's a very simple melody. Actually, I wouldn't play it there. I would have been playing it an octave higher because it's ergonomically better to be playing at this angle. Um, and then eventually, you know, as a student is getting more advanced, we're really using this to use a wide range of sounds on the piano. Because I have a little story where I, I call it the four parachutists and I imagine they're up in a helicopter. And the first one gets the first choice of parachute and he can come down, float down, in the really best quality parachute and he just floats down and produces a beautiful piano or pianissimo. And the second one gets a parachute that's a little bit um, a bit smaller and got a few holes in it, a bit older. And so he's going to come down a little bit quicker and land with a mezzo forte perhaps. And then the third one will come down a bit quicker still. And the fourth one will come down in free fall, I'm sorry to say. Um, and some pupils actually find a free fall easier. I was, I was working with a very, very stiff um, adult pianist yesterday, first lesson I'd given him, and he found the parachute a little bit harder, so we went straight onto the, onto the um, free fall, and what we just did, we just threw the hat, threw the arm, arm up, and just let it <laughs> fall through the keyboard. And then eventually, he would land on the notes. Um, and he got it. And by the end, he was his, his face had lit up. He was absolutely thrilled because his elbow and his, tis, and his wrist were absolutely stiff as a board. And he learned how to release those in one lesson. Um, 
So once you get to advanced repertoire, you're still using that idea of just dropping into the keys, but with different amounts of weight. But they're all still very free and very comfortable. So for instance, say you get to the famous uh, Rachmaninoff C sharp minor prelude, you can do a free fall on the first three notes because they're, they want to be loud. So for that, I didn't put any pressure in, I just dropped. So I just dropped my arm weight onto the notes. Now for the next section, I'm going to use arm weight, I'm going to use the parachute touch in chords, but in a very, very much more gentle way. So I'd have the C sharp down. So for each note, I'm modifying the movement to create the sound I want, but they all stem from this fundamental what I call the parachute touch. Um, so that's just a little sort of insight into, into what I do there. Um, uh, another exercise that actually isn't in um, the Complete Pianist, because actually I, I sort of rethought this a little bit after writing the book. So I'm still, still developing, still having new ideas. And I call this uh, the jellyfish. And uh, kids love it and adults love it too. You think that adults might think it's a bit patronising being taught a jellyfish exercise, but <laughs> trust me, they, be lo they love it. Um, and this is for uh, teaching um, staccato. Now, a lot of people when they're playing staccato, they start by um, teaching staccato finger touch. And they often th have been taught to somehow snatch at the note and pull it out away from the key as quickly as possible. I've often heard people talking about, oh, imagine that the piano is red hot and you want to pull your hand away as quickly as possible. But of course, if you're doing that for a very long time, what's gonna happen is these muscles are gonna get really tight and really tired because they're pulling back. So when we're playing staccato, what we want to be doing is using the natural rebound that happens when we say drop a ball on the, on the floor. We drop a ball on the floor, it naturally bounces back. And we want to use this at the piano. So sometimes I use the image of a bouncing ball. Um, but another image I use is this idea of the jellyfish. And in a way, it's combining the movement of a parachute um, with the idea of a rebound. And you're just going to come straight back up. So you're using gravity and you're using rebound. So it becomes a really genuinely effortless movement because you're not using the natural forces, which are very sort of renewable. You don't get tired because you're repeating them. So the way I start teaching this is uh, I, I sort of hope that they've got an image of a jellyfish in their mind. If they haven't, we can find a, a video on, somewhere online. And we just do a jellyfish movement. So we do this in the air. Now, you'll see what's happening. It's sort of, I sort of bounce out. There's a little bit of sort of impetus to sort of, to propel, it's a sort of, um, propelling jelly jellyfish that it's that movement that moves it around the sea um, but when it comes up it's like jelly right and this is what our hands want to be we don't want to be playing chords in this way and you see how my wrist is staying stiff my elbow is stiff um, I'm bouncing but I'm not bouncing with with ease so um, this jellyfish I then um, so I, that's the warm-up is doing a jellyfish in the air. And then we try doing it, you could try doing it on your knee, or you could do it on the wood, on a desk, or you could do it straight onto a, an open fifth. Now, I like to start with an open fifth because I do think that beginners struggle with the one, three, five triad. They somehow find it difficult to put down the third finger without putting the second and fourth, and that builds up some tension. So if we start with one and five that are more independent, then they can get the sense of what it's like to play a chord without the difficulty of deciding which fingers need to go down. So, um, and you can all try this when you, you know, if you're on a piano, you can, if you're muted, you can even try it now if you want. 
Um, so all we just do then is transmit that onto the piano. So it goes. Now, if you look at my hand in between each one, it's jelly. It's very, very soft. Um, and so within five minutes, you get them to do a beautiful effortless staccato. And again, it's actually a whole arm staccato. It's not a finger staccato. It's very well coordinated. Although I'm, I think of it as primarily from the forearm. If you watch my arm, if I just do it here so you can see a little bit better. So it's like... You can see there's quite a move, lot of movement here. There's a little bit of movement here too. Um, so because I've prepared the idea that the whole arm is coordinated well, by teaching them the parachute touch or the bobbing balloon, I call it. Um, then once they come to do staccato, they've already got a very well coordinated arm and they find it really easy. Um, Ryan, do you want me to quickly mention something about scales or do you need to get on? I don't know how. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm sure um, we, we can do that. Um... Just a quick um, mention of scales. So um, what, I, what Ryan was showing you then on the video was how when we start with a scale, say we're teaching a beginner, um, we would the first thing to do is to get the, the two hand position. So the one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And actually they have to really get their head around that and know the notes before they start any complications of adding in the thumb movement, I would say. And you see what I was doing then? I was parachuting into each half of the of the scale. So I was having a very soft hand. Um, now, so then what I do, um, so that you can see this easily, I'm moving slightly down the keyboard, um, I then start to address the, um, the thumb coming under. And again, there's two ways of thinking of this. You can either think of, oh, I just push the thumb under. Right? People talk about uh, the, the train going into a tunnel or whatever. But actually, it then puts the thumb into this position under the hand. And if you try playing notes in that position, it's actually quite hard. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is to feel that the arm is facilitating the thumb movement. So I introduce that with an exercise that I call the skipping rope exercise. Again, I use this for adults. I use this for very advanced pianists if their scales aren't good. Um, but it, kids love it as well. So, I would start with, um, I place the third finger on an F sharp, and then I just get the idea that they're just swinging their arm around in this way. And they don't even need to do it on a note, they could do it on their desk or on a table initially. They're just getting the sense of the freedom of movement. So that's the warm up. And then they start to put the thumb under. So it's a thumb to D, I'm not doing D major, so I'm going to go from D to G. And then I'm going to turn that into a little exercise. So I've gone from there. So you see how the whole arm is involved in getting the thumb into position. So when I come to do the whole scale, then my arm is taking my thumb into position and it all flows very, very smoothly and it's very, it feels very easy. Great. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I sort of just coming to me now, um, even though I've seen the demonstration of the parachute touch so much, I think that might have had a few answers for my list second concert. <laughs> so the, uh, it would be a lot easier to use gravity than to use, uh, to feel like I was in the gym bench pressing the piano. <laughs> and, the, and the jellyfish goes into octave playing because what yeah. we start do is then actually open the thing, hand out as we're playing the octaves so that it's actually feels in the end it feels really quite comfortable because we, there's a fraction of tension and release between each each octave it's not noticeable but it's there and we've trained our hands to do that well i think it's quite interesting because there's a few there's a few things in um uh in this course that really resonated with me um the one is is that um you, you're very careful about using wording and nomenclature that 
is more descriptive of the kind of feeling and movement that is, is going to be healthier and produce a better sound. And um, I remember one of, the, one of the words that was used frequently when I was studying was, yeah, how does the pianist have the stamina to play all the octaves in the concerto or in the ulcone or whatever? And stamina is a really bad word to use because I think what you're effectively doing is you're carrying tension from each movement forward. And so the jellyfish, um, I've, uh, on having a look at that one actually, I realized how much after each chord, each octave, or whatever it is, how much tension is being retained and carried over. And so it was sort of a very much a paradigm shift thinking away from stamina, um, which is I think associated with pushing yourself harder and more to getting the best result with minimum effort. Um, yeah. Because, if we, you know, if somebody's playing a whole recital, that's a huge amount of effort. And if we're putting a huge amount of effort into each octave and into each forte, um, then we'll get very tired. Whereas if you do it with ease and you use the natural forces and use the body in the way that it's naturally intended to be used, so we're using the, the strong muscles um, if, we're, if we're playing forte rather than trying to press in using just our fingers, um, then we'll get to the end of recital and we, won't, we still won't feel physically tired. We're sort of endlessly renewed. Our energy is being renewed by yeah. the movement we're making. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think, as you say, playing the piano, playing a recital is such a challenging thing in itself. Why make life more difficult than it needs to be? <laughs> I guess that's what so many of us, as a more philosophical point, so many of us tend to do, uh, certainly speaking for myself there. Um, so, Penelope, I think what would be really nice if we could maybe wrap up with, um, if you just wouldn't mind sharing a bit about where you see this going from here, because obviously we've still got to launch the course, but I think this is all part of a, a much bigger picture in terms of your plans um, going forward. Yes, well, I'm very much aware of the fact that um, teachers, a lot of teachers really, really would benefit from for some more help um, from uh, better understanding of, of technique. So I've created, a, 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 I'm bringing this course under the umbrella of something I'm calling the Roskill Academy. Um, and it will include not only this course, but quite a lot of online um, workshops, um, question and answers, discussions, um, extra advice. Um, and I've actually been doing this course um, online uh, live. Um, the, uh, since the beginning of this year and 80 people have already done the course um, and so I'm uh, and that had a little bit more chance for um, in fact there's one two people here who've actually done that course on la the live one um, and that then gives a bit more chance for discussion and and a bit more feedback individual feedback um, so I'm looking into ways where how people doing the um, online course, the recorded one, can also get a few additional benefits from that. And I'm also trying to um, create an accreditation system. I set some guidelines where people can get credit for having studied this course um, and have a certificate for it and certification of it and be included in, in the Roskill Academy if they pass a, an assessment, um, be included in, a, in the Roskill Academy um, recommended list of teachers. If people want to do that, there's obviously no obligation to do it at all, but it, it is an option to work towards. Um, what I've also been doing is creating some beginner's books um, to go with, alongside this course. And some of the material is actually in the course and it's in the additional materials and you'll be able to access it easily. Um, but I'm, I've I just finished writing books one and two, which take you up to so the second year of learning. Um, and then I'm, I'm in the middle of just writing the third book and then there's going to be two more to come. Um, and so these will help to guide teachers through, through the levels uh, for the first perhaps about five years of teaching. Um, so they've got additional materials, that, you know, it's very, very step, step by step um, exercises and pieces that bring in that particular topic um, in a piece of music. Um, and then the final thing I want to really do is to is to sort of start to be able to hand over a little bit. You know, I'm I'm very conscious of the fact that I've got a lot of knowledge um, about injury and and how to work with injured pianists, and I want to hand that on. So the next thing I'm going to be doing, uh, uh, and when I've finished all these books and everything else, is um, start to just 
create a course perhaps for teachers and to really how to work with injured pianists because I think we need more of us who have good understanding of this and I really want to pass on to, to other teachers all the experience I've had with, with working with pianists. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> that's uh, definitely such an important thing. I, I'm generally surprised to the extent that I'm not surprised anymore when I see even the go-to meetups of like adult amateurs, um, I would say the majority have had some kind of issue with injury. So there's definitely a need for that. Um, but um, I think um, what I'd also like to say as well in terms of um, for, uh, I suppose by way of closing, is um, so I guess the question is going to be how do we find out more about this um, <clears> or <throat> what next? So basically, I think if you've signed up for this uh, event, you'll be on our mailing list. So we'll let you know um, when there's further news and announcements. Um, so, so we're hoping to launch the first parts of the course uh, fairly soon in um, the fall. Um, so we'll be letting you know about that. There will also, as Penelope said, there'll be some workshops around the material as well, because we'd like to incorporate a more uh, real-time interpersonal uh, element to it. Um, something I should also add as well <clears throat> is that we're going to be making it available as a standalone online course for teachers to do. Um, that might be very useful also from the perspective of CPD, uh, for those of you who um, are at an organization where, or where you are required to do that. So there'll be some kind of different options for um, obtaining that accreditation, if you like. Um, you could, as I say, you could do it as a standalone on its own. We also are in conversations with various uh, uh, educational institutions about uh, things like licensing for students, uh, for pedagogy students, um, and for faculty. So there's also other ways that we'll be making this available. So if you do represent um, or are working at an organization where it may be that um, access to this material will be really useful either, either as a standalone module for your students or as a, a complement to an existing study program um, then um, yeah it's definitely uh, please do get in touch with us because there's there's quite a few ways that we can uh, make that possible I think um, at this stage I know it's a, particularly anyone who's at NCKP I think there's an event starting fairly soon so I think I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for joining us uh, from uh, literally all corners of the globe so <laughs> uh, lovely to have you all here for those of you uh, in um, uh, in the in the states or across the pond uh, I hope you have a really good day further and uh, for those of you um, all the way in the east uh, well sleep well <laughs> and,